Hello, everyone. Welcome to the EEG Podcast. I'm here with my good friend, Vanessa Demopoulos. Demopoulos! I got it. You, you see? Get it. Little monster. Though. That's right. That's how I know you. Little monster. How you doing? I'm amazing. How are you doing? Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, no, I've been good, you know. Just living the dream. You yeah. Know, you know how it is, the struggle and everything else. But, man, we make it, you know. Yes. And just got to appreciate all the little things in life that we have in front of us. Yes. Right? And that's why the dream is the dream. Yes. Because we've been through the struggles. Exactly. And that's where all the appreciation really yes. comes from. And a lot of people um, don't know that, oh, yeah, they see you now. You're in the UFC. But they don't see the struggle that it took to get there. Yeah. All the ups and downs, you know, and that's something that I want to talk to you about. So let's start right off the bat, your childhood, your upbringing. Where'd you grow up? Tell me a little bit of that and just keep going. Yeah, I, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Born in Cleveland, was raised in Greece for a little while with my grandparents and then moved back to America um, when I was young. And being raised by your grandparents, like that kind of shows a little bit right there. Like my parents um, were in the entertainment industry. And okay. like my mom was an exotic entertainer. My dad was a DJ. That's how they met, you know, so crazy lifestyle. And I was uh, I was introduced to a lot of very like emotionally compromising things at a very young age and um, kind of rattled me up. You know, right. like if you take a pop can and just like shake it really hard and yeah. leave the cap on it. Like that was me all the time. Um, I was always just very angry, very aggressive, you know, just like mad at the world, very emotional, you know, like. I cried so much as a kid, I like, I'd throw up just from like being upset for right. no reason, man. Um, and then I was a teenager and I started like skateboarding. I found being a skater chick, you know, hmm. and like. Interesting. Yeah. A lot of people wouldn't know that. Yeah, I was a skater chick, man, All you right. know, and <laughs> doing the half pipe things. Okay. And, um, you know, super, super rough and uh, just really like. I loved that, you know, but like that was like a whole community for me, you right. know, and um, I found bearing arms there and got into so much trouble, dude, yeah. so much trouble that like people don't think about when they see me because right. I'm so happy and positive. Right. But like we had like cops at the house like every other week, man, you know, what like, were you doing? I was I was stealing shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was fighting. At, people. What, at what age was this? We're talking like. <sighs> Anywhere from like 14, 15 oh, to 18. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But I, you know, me, I had my kids at a young age. I was doing dumb stuff. You know, I grew up in California. Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes it's because your surroundings, the people you're surrounding yourself with and yes. the structure. Yes. It's tough, you know, and people think, oh, you know, no, you're a product of your environment sometimes. Yeah. And um, I think that's what it was. But there's opportunities for change, right? Yes, there are. Yes, there are. You know, and I, I didn't find my opportunities. Um, it, it took a little bit of a spiral down for right. a while. You know, yeah. I got kicked out of four schools in one calendar year oh. for just like fighting and just being unruly. Um, and then after the fourth school, I was still 17 years old. I found myself on the streets mm. and I was living in an abandoned house for a while. And it wasn't until there were like kids playing hide and seek in the place that I was finding a safe haven for mm. where, and I mean, I'm 17 years old, bro. You yeah. know, like I was, I don't know. I Did you run up. away? Yeah. Or, kinda, yeah. you know? <laughs> okay. Yeah. What do you mean? Kind of. Kinda. Well, because like, I didn't really like run away. Like my, my grandparents were always there for me, but mm. like they were older generation, mm. you yeah. know? So like, they loved me as like they I had all the love in the world, bro. Right. Like literally couldn't shouldn't have complained about a thing. But um I was just an angry kid, you okay. know. So they like kinda let me do what I thought I needed to do. Right. Yeah. So like they knew that it was a terrible situation, but their options were call the police, which was gonna put me in jail, or just like let me run free and know that I'd come home every now and again. Right. You know? So it's like it was a double edged sword for them. And right. I put them through so much, man. But I woke up one day and I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. You know? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And so then you came to the States, right? Yeah. No, no, I wasn't You're in already States. in the I'm States. In the States. Okay. I'm in Cleveland at okay. this time. And then after that, you're 17, 18 years old. Yeah. We got to work, right? Yeah. I, I, I hit the field, you know? So I, I was working in a factory at 18. 
um, didn't graduate at this time. So, and then all of a sudden I hear all my friends are like going to like commencements and like proms and all that. And I was like, and I'm working in a factory, you know, and I'm like, damn, I want to go do that stuff. So I hit up the school and they actually let me, they let Mm. me come back and do that stuff. So I did get to go to prom and I did get to graduate, um, with like a 0.9 GPA, which is crazy. <laughs> crazy. Yeah. But I mean, I was a ninth grade dropout essentially considering right. how many schools I got kicked out of. Mm. So ninth grade education, but they gave me the, the diploma because okay. they saw potential in my future. You look, look, you look like you have potential. Thanks, bro. <laughs> Thanks, bro. All right. And then you were like, okay, I'm working at this factory. Yes. What are we doing next? Man. Come on now. All right. Here, yeah, I think yeah, this yeah. is what everybody wants to do. We know where we're going here. <laughs> so uh, I ended up walking into a club and I saw uh-huh. the strip club, you know, okay. and I saw these girls on the pole and I was like, man, that looks awesome. I was like, that looks so freaking cool. It was so beautiful, you right. know, and um, I had gotten some lap dances and the girl didn't let me touch her butt. And I was like, she just took I all just my paid, money. Right? Just yeah, paid. she just took all my money. I didn't even touch her butt. Like, right. what the heck? It, like man, this sounds like a cool job, you know? So yeah. And I started dancing like right there. So I quit the factory, started dancing at 18 years old. And, um, how long, how long did you dance for? 13 years, 13 years. Yeah. Yeah. Recently retired baby. That's right. Let's go. Did you get your, your pole (laughs) hall of fame? I have a pole in my living room, but you got some awards, didn't you during, during this time? Man. Like, so yeah, but one I'm of the recognized. best, right? I'm was, recognized. Yes. I'm so recognized. Every, let everybody know what, what it is. Yeah. So I am one of the leading exotic entertainers in the entire industry. Um, I've written two books about the industry okay. and I used to compete all around the country. So I was, I've opened up a lot of clubs like where the clubs would freshly open and I'd be one of the first entertainers um, on their roster. And then like, for example, like New York would fly me out there Mm -hmm. just to teach their girls how to dance. Okay. You know, and like, yeah, like New York, you know, like Manhattan, like Tampa, Florida would fly me out just to be an entertainer there for their weekends. Like, because that's how, like, that's the quality of entertainment I would provide. You know, yeah, I was a professional on the pole. I was a true aerialist. You know, I knew how to talk to to people and like I am in the people business. So, yeah, that's awesome. And then 13 years after Mm -hmm. you decided, hey, let me try this MMA shit. No, not 13 years after. No, no. 13 years during. During. So you were so you were stripping and fighting and fighting at the same time. At the same time. Man, tell us a little bit about the MMA and, and trying to balance both, right? Yeah. Um, I did speak to Kenny Johnson. He was telling me a couple of stories <laughs> that you would like drive yes. to a certain city, go to work. Yep. And show up on Monday. Yep. And train. I was there on Monday. Right? Yep. He was like, man, I, she just had so much energy. And she, he would tell you sometimes, hey, you, you need to choose one. Yeah, he did. But. Tell us how that how you balance that. Yeah, um, the balance was difficult. So even like it didn't matter what city I felt like I lived in. Yeah. I would like move to cities because I'm like, oh, they have clubs and gyms that I can train at and work at. And it like never worked out. I'd always have to. So, for example, when I lived in Los Angeles, right. I would train two to three times a day, four times sometimes. Right. On a Friday, for example, I would spar, right? right? Early in the morning, Fridays are sparring. So I'd spar and then I'd shower up and get in the car to decompress. Mm. Four hour drive from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. Mm. So now I'd drive all the way to Las Vegas and then I'd work an eight hour shift at the club. You couldn't leave before eight hours or they'd charge you like a freaking astronomical amount of money. (laughs) Like they're like, they want to make sure that you're there for eight hours. Yeah. So I'd work for eight hours until like 7 a.m. in the morning Mm -hmm. and then I would sleep all day on Saturday, work at Saturday night, work Sunday night, and then I'd leave early on Sunday, which early is like 2 a.m. Right. And then I'd drive all the way back home, sleep just a few hours, and then be at training on Monday morning. Oh, and I, and I would hit open mats here in Las Vegas on nice. Sundays. That's like crazy. I'd work Saturday night until 7 a.m. Yeah. I'd sleep like three hours right. and wake up and hit the open mats. Now let me ask you this and be honest. Yeah. Did you ever bump into, let's say, in the clubs, some of those guys that you train with? Yeah. You don't have to mention names. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
And well, what would they say when they saw you? <laughs> I'd just be like, hey, bro, let's not make this weird. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Would they ask for lap dance? Uh, so I had a rule. I never <laughs> danced for anyone I knew. Okay. Yes. That's fair. Because I'm not trying to make people fall in love with me if I know you. Right. You know, like right, right. we're homies, you know? Right. Yeah. But I'd run into people and I'd be like, yo, what's up? And I'd sit down at party and I'd bring other girls over to the table to dance. I'd buy lap dances for my friends, you know? That's like, awesome. Yeah. Like I'd take Here money go, out of my bro. garter belt and give it to the girls and be like, yo, dance for him. Like, nice. Yeah. And during that time, did you ever struggle? Like, you know, were you just bouncing couch to couch? Mm-hmm. Were you, did you have your own place? You know, I'm, I'm sure there was probably times where you just didn't have enough, right? Because at that time you're fighting for what LFA and all these other organizations. I know they don't pay as much as right. the UFC. Right. I mean, it's not easy, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> like all of it. I slept out of my car. A lot of the times I was sleeping couch to couch, like anywhere that would give me somewhere to stay. Um, there was a long time during my jujitsu career where I was traveling a different city almost every weekend to compete in jujitsu. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't dance every weekend. Cause when are the tournaments? Right. Saturdays. Saturdays. Right. And I'm traveling to new cities all the time. Right. So I had enough money to afford a rental car, maybe not enough money to afford a hotel to stay in. Right. So I'd sleep in the car, I'd shower in the gyms, and I'd compete, you know, and do wow. what I had to do. Wow. And uh, yeah. And shout out to your uh, professor, Jiva, right? Shout yeah. out to Jiva. Shout mm-hmm. out to uh, Vitor Oliveira. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah GF team. Yeah. Nice. For a long time until I was a brown belt. Okay. Yeah. Man, and it was, it was just, it was crazy, you know, and, but nobody knew these things about me, you know? There's a lot of, like today, we're, we're releasing a lot of stuff that people don't really know the struggle. Yeah. They say, oh, look, look at her now. She's doing, she's making it. Yeah. Yeah, but. She's pretty. She's happy. She's What so about peppy, when you were like, struggling? Yes. Right? They don't see that part. Your first pair of shoes, you sleeping in the car, you know, the grind. Oh, yeah. I, that's what one thing that people don't realize, like. I mean, fighter, there's, it's a grind all day long. You you have to treat it like a job. Yes. Eight-hour job, keep going. Yes. And, um, man, it's paid off. Mm-hmm. You uh, were in LFA. Yes. You got the call. I was the champion for the LFA. There you go. Yeah. And you got the call from Jason House, mm-hmm. your manager, mm-hmm. and said, hey, UFC, baby, let's go. Let's go, yeah. And how'd, how'd that feel? How'd that feel after this whole entire, prog- you know, process that you were dancing and sleeping in your car and fi- uh, training at the same time how'd that how'd that feel after, when you got that phone call i can't explain to you what that felt like like the just like the sheer emotion and like the tears and like the like the freedom of it you know like you you can't even begin to fathom all of the years of hard work and struggle right that like it's like just knowing that it was all for the right purpose, the right reason. I kept my dreams in front of me. And that's why for me, when I was struggling, I was still smiling. I was sleeping in my car, sleeping on couches. I was still happy. I still had gratitude. I was still appreciative of the couches that I slept on. You know, I kept my eyes on God. I kept my eyes on my mission right. because I knew that one day I would be here and I'm still rising right now. You, are. you know, like I'm still like super grateful for every opportunity that I get, you know, like it's just, it's crazy because I've, I've lived so much of it and I just like, I understand it, but I always believed in myself, even when people didn't always believe in what I was doing and why I was doing what I was doing. Right. You know, people thought I was crazy, man. Right. You know, like I love, like even Kenny and I love him so much, man. And he was like, why are you driving yeah. so much? And it's like, cause bro, like I got to eat too. You know, I have to be able to put enough money in my pocket to fight for the LFA mm. and to make it, mm. you know, like I was a stripper. So people think that I was making like, hand over fist money, which I was, but I didn't care to be a stripper. I saw being a fighter, like stripping was just a means to my end. So it's like, I made just enough money for me to be able to sustain being a fighter. Did you feel while you were stripping, there was other girls that were stripping for, to pay their tuition in college? A lot of them? Sometimes. Yeah. Not usually. Uh, Not usually. No. 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 I'm just kidding. I don't know. I'm just like <laughs> you asking. You see them in there, they're making that money, You know what? Man. But I'll tell you what. I, uh, people always told me, 
hey, they would always invite me to the strip club. Mm-hmm. But I was never into that stuff. I was more like, I can't see myself sitting there and having some girl dance on me and give her 20 bucks or 40 bucks <laughs> or sit around the table and just be like, ah. here's a dollar. <laughs> like, I just couldn't see it. I thought maybe because I worked so hard for my money. Yeah. I was like, man, I'll take these 20 dollars, go buy me some in and out or some Tommy's. Right. It was right. just me. Right. right. Everybody, hey, if that's for you, Dif- different, different strokes, strokes, strokes man. For different yeah, folks. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I asked. I'm like, man, uh, you know, I'm not familiar with it a lot yeah there's um, maybe like we're talking like three percent of yeah. girls are actually just in there and getting their money like right. trying to go and, and the other 97 percent. oh they're career entertainers man yeah and some of those men they stay there for years like you're talking they could be in their 40s right? yeah yeah so when i first got into the industry i was kind of you know i was fucking up on life <laughs> a little bit I was right. fucking up on life right but i think it was those girls that really scared me sober you know, where I was like, wow, like that's, that is what I get to look forward to if I don't change my life. Right. You know? So when I found fighting, I was like, this is it for me. You know, like, this is what I want to do. I do want to create that future. Nice, nice, nice. So we're in the UFC now. Let's go. We're two, two and oh in the UFC. Yeah. And I'm a broadcaster. Broadcaster. You're doing that. Your first fight. I had the opportunity of being, uh, in the hotel with, Silvana. Yeah. Right? I didn't corner her. Okay. Right? Okay. I was I there. Not at you, bro. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I did tell her, I said, listen, do not enter her guard. <laughs> I didn't. I'd be honest with you. And I yeah. told her, do not. Yeah. Right? So, because I know. Uh huh. Right? So when I saw you, when I saw her knock you down, I was like, okay, I'm watching this from our, 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 our hotel room. Yeah. And I'm like, don't enter. Don't enter. You just entered. <laughs> right? And I was like, I said, the problem. And look. And yep. you all the majority of your fights yep. are like that. You you go into war. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it, when it gets to that point, like you turn it up. Your flexibility helps you so much. Yes. Right? Yes. And man, you, you've been doing well. You've been killing it. Thank you. The second fight too. Yeah. Look at that. Yes. That's, uh, Everybody said if I didn't finish that fight. That I was gonna lose. Yes, and I thought so. It was it was really really close. Yeah, but I man, beat her on the feet. I yes. beat her at the game yeah. that she was supposed to beat me at. Absolutely. Yeah. But you've always been one of those little monsters that just goes forward. Yeah. I mean, your battles with Godinez too. Like those were battles too. Like every fight I I watched, I'm like, man, like she's got the heart, she's got the mentality. Um, you're gonna have to finish her like completely because she's gonna keep coming. Thank you. And that's what I found. Uh, you know in all the fights that you've that you've gotten into. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. It's it's um, you know, we're talking about life and I think that fighting just directly correlates with that, you know. I have overcome so many things that the world doesn't necessarily understand. You know, what they see is the fighter that's in the cage, you right. know, and they see the the pretty girl that's in front of a camera who's like being super happy. And I am happy, but it's because I understand what the other side of the coin looks like. Right. When I fight you're never going to break me, bro. Right. You're never going to break me. You might win. You might hurt me. You might but win. You ain't going to break me. You ain't fucking breaking me, bro. <laughs> Life never broke me. Yeah. You know, and I always found a way to overcome. Right. And I think that that's so important for people to understand that you may be going through a struggle, but that is only a momentary lapse of time right. for the entire vision of your life. Because there's so much more behind those curtains that you can't see of the struggle that you're currently experiencing. Because Mm -hmm. on the other side of that is the beautiful life that you could be living and looking forward to if you just believe in yourself in that moment and know that once I get over this fucking hump, there's beauty on the other side of that mountain. Agree. But you got to fucking climb it. Yeah, I agree. And we all have our mountains. And, And you know what? And this is what I tell people a lot. I said, man. For the people that have struggled when they were young and didn't come, they come from nothing, it's easy for you to, okay, I'm already at the top. But if I lose everything, it's okay. I know how to find myself to get back where I was because I've, I've been down here, I've been right? There. And I feel there. like you've also done that too. It's like You're like, hey, it's okay. I've been like this up and down, up and down. I know how to, but for people that have always been here, when they hit rock bottom, they pretty much stay there, you know? Yeah. And, um... I see that 
You know what I mean? Like, you know, you'll figure it out. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And now you're uh, working for the UFC podcast, you know, broadcast? UFC, yes, yes. I'm on UFC Fight Pass now. Okay. Um, yeah, Look at official. that. Official. Official like a Let's whistle. Go. Let's go. Well, right, right. Dreams come true, baby. Yes, they do. And what's 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 your next fight? Anything lined up? Yes, looking forward to November nineteenth. Okay. Against uh, currently Maria Oliveira. Maria so, Oliveira. Yeah, nice. and she actually trains at the Performance Institute mainly. And I see her like every time I'm there. I'm like, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> but you guys are professionals, and I yeah, you yeah. go through the PI, you bump into your, your opponents all the time, or yeah. somebody, your future opponents. Yes. And again, you guys have always been very respectful. That's one thing I have to say about the women. Yes. They respect each other. They beat each other up. And then they shake hands and say, hey, let's go get a drink or something. You, you know? know? Yeah. That's the way it should be. Honestly, and it is. It is. You know, well, for me, at least. Obviously, Kamzat and uh, right. Diaz, which has been happening right now, whenever yeah. you guys watch he this. He didn't make He didn't make weight. Mr. Bernard Pons. Just man. nine. Just a big no. <laughs> That's Jeez. insane. So, but not everybody's a professional, you I know? know? Yeah. And it, I, we are all very aggressive, yes. you know? And this is a very primitive sport where... It's like, I mean, we are real life gladiators, yeah. you know, our sport is one of the first sports to have ever evolved, Yeah, you know, I agree. period. Yeah. That's what Coliseums were built on is true. things that we do. That's true. So if you had a message to send to the next generation of fighters or just people out there, what would the message be? Know what you want. Understand that it doesn't matter what you're currently experiencing that this is simply a stepping stone for where you're trying to get to and have your goals in front of your face at all times, because it's very easy to get distracted by life. Mm. And the more you start to climb, the more distractions are going to come your way. So your struggles change. It's no longer the struggle of where am I going to sleep and can I even afford peanut butter and jelly today mm. versus the struggle of, well, all of my attention is being pulled in a million directions because now people do want to be around you. So, you know, know where you came from and know where you want to go and keep the important things important to you. Man, that was good. I like that. Well, thank you so much, Vanessa, for coming on to the podcast. I had an amazing time. Any shout outs? Uh, to your fans, your sponsors, it's all you. Come check me out, guys. Lil Monster Demo on Instagram. I love you guys. Like, this is amazing. Thank you so much for having me no, on man. here. It's it is amazing to just learn about your upbringing and the struggle. I yeah. think a lot of people will really appreciate that. I mean, we already know you're an amazing fighter, but they don't know that the struggle is real. The real struggle. The real struggle. So, <laughs> man, thank you so much. Thank Again, you. Again, thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, keep evolving in everything that you do. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you. We'll <laughs>